Good morning, welcome, and we'll start off, of course, with our bracha. Baruch Ata Adonai Loheinu Melech Olam Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to go to the screen share. And we are starting this very interesting chapter uh, that breaks the story of Joseph, and now we're going to focus on Judah. And here is where we are. Vayikach Yehuda Isha Le'er Bechoro, and Judah took a wife for his son, for his firstborn son, Er. Ushma Tamar, her name was Tamar. And there's no Rashi on this. Vayhi, Er Bechor Yehuda, and it was that Er, the firstborn of Judah, and I think that there's interesting, you notice the duplication of that term of referring to Er as Judah's first, as his Bechor. I mean, after all, uh, we would know that, right? We already know he's his Bechor. So what is the Torah coming to tell us now that he's Bechor? And I would say that what's happening now is that the, the Torah is suggesting how this change is going to take place in Judah. Judah's personality is going to undergo a change because of his coming experience, and he is going to feel, feel his father's pain, the pain that he caused his father. He is going to feel himself now. And I'm sure that there was there is something very special about bringing a child into the world, if that is something you want to do. And when you are successful in doing that, that gives you a very special feeling. Not to say that your subsequent children aren't also very, very lovely and special, but there's a unique element to this being his firstborn. And that's why I think the Torah is repeating that to tell you Judah's feelings when this happens. Because what's going to happen is that his firstborn, Ra Be'enei Hashem, it doesn't give you a specific here. It simply says that he was evil in the eyes of the Lord, Vayimi Tehu Hashem, and Hashem killed him, slew him. So now Judah is experiencing what it's like to lose a child, right? He was instrumental in Jacob's losing Joseph, and now he's going to experience it. So as I said before, while we don't see God directly speaking to anyone in this story, except much later on where God tells Jacob to go ahead and go down to Egypt, and that he'll bring the people back from there in the in future, there is no direct speech from God. But nevertheless, the Torah is trying to teach us how to interpret divine activity within the everyday goings on of our lives. Here we go. So Rashi picks up on the fact that there's, you know, there's this general statement that he acted evilly, not really helpful, right? And I see that kind of thing happening, where people condemn other people and don't mention what exactly it is that they did. So in other words, it's more of an emotional thing. But when it comes to God, that's not the way it works, okay? So he says... What, to, Rabbi? Yes. What's that, uh, what's that uh, wife's name that he married? That can I, uh, what's her name? Uh, should we, uh, okay, if, uh, who are we talking about here? Who, when you say he married, who's the he you're talking about? Heir? No, Judas I'm talking firstborn. about when he married uh, when he married that uh, that candidate. Well, again, who's the uh, he? Uh, quote, what's quote, your the, name? Who's the he that you're talking about? Are you talking about who Jacob? That? Or are you talking about uh, Air? Who are you talking you, about? No, I'm not talking about Air. I'm talking about I'm talking about uh, the wife he married when he got here. When you Air. say he, you're talking about Judah. Yehuda. Judah, yeah. Judah okay. married. So uh, we didn't sure. get. A, yeah, we don't have her name. We only know her as oh. but. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, Bathira, I think. Yeah, oh, Bathira. That, that, That's all, all we know, I think. It's her name oh. was, I believe, we can look it up in a, fa in a second. Here, I can look it okay. up. Okay. Uh, uh, Shua, Bat Shua. There we go. 
Bar her name Chua. is yeah her name and she's not canaanite necessarily there's actually a whole deal here right here but ishkanani where he explains where there's a discussion in psachim that it's not it's a, it's a daughter of a merchant but i i, I don't want to get into that right now i want to okay do, okay i don't okay. want to change the subject okay yeah go so, ahead thank you thank you okay so karata shel onan right as the uh, the same wickedness that onan did what does he do? What's the wickedness? Mashchit zaro, he destroys his semen. Shine'emar ba'onan, as, as is stated regarding Oman. But, and it says with Onan, vayamot gam oto. So it says with regards to Onan, because Jada is going to lose two children, okay? He, it's, uh, as it says regarding Onan, he killed, that is God, slew gam oto. He as well, the gum, right? And because it says as well, we understand that it's referring to for the same reason. Kamitato shall er, mitato shall onan. Just as the death of the reason for er's death was the death of onan. They're one and the same. Velama, going on. So we, we are going to be given the reason as to why, er, why Onan, right, the brother, we're going to be told in a moment why Onan uh, spilt his seed, okay? Why did Er do that? It wouldn't have been for the same reason. So the reason Er did, so that she would not become pregnant, and that it might impair her beauty. He did not want her beauty to be impaired by having to go through. He didn't want to see varicose veins. Okay. Whatever. That's why he didn't do it. But again, it's, it's dealing now with some values and how serious that kind of stuff is about. Uh, it's, a, another, it's obviously a very deep subject, uh, and it, runs, it runs somewhat countercultural to our present culture. But nevertheless, it's here. It's here. And and of course the whole thing is called onanism, right? So mm. uh, going on. Oh, here we go. Vayomer Yehuda Onan. So he said Yehuda. We already know that he has three sons, right? He has Er Onan and Shela. Shela is the third son. That's the name. Okay. So Yehuda said to Onan, Bo el eshet achicha, come to your cohabit with your brother's wife, the Yavim Oto, and, perf and perform the duty of a Yavum, of a Yavam, of a Levir. Okay, so that we know how ancient this particular tradition was to provide children. Okay. Yeah, but, but Rabbi, the Jewish think, law uh, says you can't marry, oh, uh, you can't oh. marry your brother's wife. Okay. Yes. Right. Okay. Harlan, give give me a moment, please. Let me finish okay. the sentence and then I'll I'll comment on that. You're right. And so that you can raise seed for your brother. You'll provide seed for your for your deceased brother. Yes. Uh, Harlan, that's exactly correct. The Torah forbids a person to marry his brother's wife under normal circumstances. And, and for that very reason, it is a specific circumstance where your brother dies without children, where the Torah commands the surviving brother to, in fact, uh, marry her and, uh, and provide children or a child in, his, to, in the name of his brother. So there's a tractate called Yevamot in the Talmud. It's considered one of the three most difficult tractates. And part of the reason for it being such a difficult tractate is this apparent contradiction of law that you pointed out. And that's what makes it so that there are circumstances where a levirate marriage can take place. There are also circumstances where a levirate marriage cannot take place. And this isn't the time and place for me to go into some of the details of the complexity of it, but um, it's definitely dealt with, and the point you made is well taken. It's a circumstantial thing. And that's, it's only in that particular circumstance where you are allowed to do it. You're not going to say your favorite punchline? <laughs> go on. Circumstantial. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yes. Well, I wanted to see if you learned it. Yes. Yeah. 
Okay. It's, it's, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's, it is a great, it's one of the great truths of the world, yeah. right? And a lot of people, I think, don't really know it. They're not aware of it. The punchline. The punchline, yes. Yeah. Right. Circumstances alter cases. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's go on here. I'm going to find the place. Uh, okay. Vayeda Onan, and Onan realized, he knew, ki lo lo yehazera. He knew that if he gave seed to Tamar, uh, heir's wife, heir's widow, that this child, this child that she conceived, would not be his. Vahaya imba el eshet achiv. And so whenever he uh, was intimate with his brother's wife, Veshichet Artsa, he would s destroy it, he would spill it on the ground. The Vilti Naton Zera Lachav, so as to avoid providing seed for his brother. That's, of course, the definition of onanism, of what's called onanism. Right, uh, let's see, there's a. Uh, that, would, that would put that child ahead of him in. Correct in the in what inheritance that would actually I right do, um think possibly i don't know possibly yeah, well. i have to go back over the laws of inheritance there okay um because i think i think that it goes according to generation so that if you if a brother dies it's the surviving brothers that then inherit but it could be uh golda i wouldn't i mean wanna, I, I, I don't know but that would make, that would make it. the most sense to me yeah, as to why sense. he wouldn't do it that would, it would it or he would. just didn't like yeah. his brother well no or else he didn't want it, it's true the other point okay so when we're talking about inheritance we probably we might be talking about whatever property his brother had right whatever property heir had might come to him there is the I, I'd have to review some of the laws regarding inheritance and how they're affected by this particular thing. But right now, uh, we uh, just to take it on the simplest level that I could imagine. Right here we go. Let's let's here's Rashi. came Zera, and this is the ending of Chet, where Jacob, where Jacob is saying to, uh, excuse me, where Judah is saying to Onan, raise seed. Right, he and Rashi explains Habin Yikare Al Shem Hamet that the son would be called according to the name of the deceased, would take on the deceased's name. Now I don't think necessarily it's what we talk about when we name someone. It may be the basis of a tradition of where we name someone in memory of somebody else. And maybe that is what it means. That's certainly what it says. But I, I have a feeling there's more to it than that, and probably having to do with inheritance as Golda is raising. Let's keep going. I'm um, okay. looking to see. Let's you go ahead. Brother, let's, the brother's name was John. Yes. Then the um, brother sired on uh, his brother's wish. Yes. Would that be called son of John? That could well be, you know, something I love that interpretation, um, mm -hmm. Judith, I think that makes sense. It really does. Right. And here, while he, and it makes very good sense because here Onan would be providing the seed, but the child is being named son of the, 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 the deceased. Yeah, that actually makes total sense. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Onward. Vayeda. Okay, so we said this. We already read Tet. So let's take a look here. Veshichet Artsa. Right. He he destroyed it by by putting by sending it to the ground. Okay. Let's take a look here. Dash. <laughs> it's so interesting. Dash mi bifnim. He thresh he threshes on the inside. Vezore mi bachutz, and he sows on the outside. So he's enjoying he's enjoying the uh, recreational elements of intimacy, but he's not actually doing what it's supposed to lead to. Okay, so this is from Bereshit Rabbah, where they use that particular expression to describe what he was doing. So uh, onwards. So now we see that Judah has now lost two children, 
two sons. Vayome Yehudala Tamar Kalato. So Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Shvi Almana Betavicha, remain as a widow in the house of your father. Adigdal Shela Bni until Shela, my son, has matured, has grown up. Ki Amar, and the Torah now tells you what was really in Judah's mind, right? For he thought. Have, sorry, I must have missed that, but what happened? How did the second son die? I, I, he died. I, we, we, just, we just said that God killed him. We don't explain oh, how. Uh, okay. he had a, we could have had a heart attack. Uh, he could have had a building fall on him. I don't know. He could okay. have fallen off a cliff. But we, essentially, we say that God killed him. Yeah, I mean, I heard that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Didn't, they were both didn't evil. Know. They were both evil. Yeah, they, they, were, the they, they were considered evil and evil to a point where God, God's justice got applied immediately. Okay. So they were saying what, uh, what Judah was thinking. All right. Uh, yeah. Ki Amar, for he thought, that is Judah thought, pen yamut gam ke'echav, lest he die like his brothers. Vatelech Tamar, so, te, so Tamar went, vateshev beit aviha, and she remained in her father's house. And Rashi explains what's going on here. Ki Amar, so again, so many examples of the word Amar doesn't mean say, it means think. Or in this case, he was worried, right? Klomar, that is to say, doche haya ota. He was putting her off. He was simply de delaying her. Bikesh shelo ha bikesh. This is what he really was trying to do. In other words, what Judah was simply trying to do was to put her off entirely. Shelo haya because it was not in his mind. He was had no intention, the hasialo, to marry her to his third son. He had no intention. So he put he put her off this way. Ki amar penyamut, because he was worried lest he die. Muhzeketi, it appears that it is established, right? She Yamutu Ansheha that her husband would her husbands would die. Now that it happened to two husbands, this is the this is the reputation she has. So that's what he did onwards so um, he's still yeah i just want to there's been a lot of um chat okay. and i have a different understanding than the people who are okay. making these comments okay. um one one understanding that i have that i feel is different than what's been said is that i don't believe that there's a given that this is um necessarily related to Judah's inheritance, and I think that seems to be a an underlying premise in in the chat. Um, and another thing is that I don't think that when they say that he was um, taking the father's name again, I think it's like what what was it Judith? I think said Ben so and so. Right. It's not right. that they have like a, the same name that they're called the same right. you know first name, but instead of like saying you know like let's say. Um, you know, Richard was was the um, dead brother, and his brother John um, married the the wife. Then yeah. it would it would be Richardson, not Johnson. That's Perfect. the way I see it. That yep. not not that the child would be named Richard, correct? Like the father, right. but the son of. I, I and the, and the third thing was that um, I don't think that. Um, whether it's um it, i don't think the gender of the child is, matters i mean the gender can't be pre predetermined at least not at this time and if inheritance were the issue certainly the gender would marry matter because no girls did not inherit but um but i don't think that that you know a leveret marriage is dependent upon the, you know, the success of the lever leveret marriages. I mean, they, they always would hope for a male, but that's to, you know, inherit their fathers, not their grandfathers, you know, so, lineage, I think. Right. right. So he, here's, here's the thing. I think Judith's interpretation is really, it's spot on, okay? However, a couple of other things. One is it's a story, 
it's a story. So the assumption is that, that, that in fact, she would have a son, okay, that they would have a son. I will tell you that although we know that in a case where a man did not have any sons, the inheritance would be passed on to his daughters. We have that whole thing about the, the daughters of Tzalovchad, okay, where they have exactly that situation. It's not, I mean, it's, it's not a big issue. What is a big issue is inheritance. It is true that a lot of what Yevamot deals with also has to do with how the inheritance is passed on and, and who gains the property and all that kind of stuff. So we can't just totally dismiss it. But for the time being, and I think it's sufficient to understand it the way Judith interpreted it and, and not get um, overly concerned about realities here because it is a story and it has a different, you know, it has a point to make and it's going to say it in the way that a story is going to nar narrate it. And we shouldn't get, I think, overly concerned about um, what really might happen, just like I think the approach that tries to look at the Bible as a historical book is actually way off base. You know, just totally misses the point. Or uh, not, if not totally, but at least misses the point. So, uh, yeah, let's, so let's go on, if we may. So we have, we have her going back, okay? Let's see if we have anything more. Yeah, we're on to the next, next verse, on to 12. Vayir buheyamim, and the days grew long. Took a long time, months, years passed. Vatamot bat Shua eshet Yehuda, and the daughter of Shua, the wife of Judah, she died. She passed away. Vayinachem Yehuda, and Judah was comforted. Okay, he got over his grief. Vayal al gozazet and so he went up to supervise the shearing of his sheep. Who vechira? He and chira. And I think there's a vav here. I didn't have a chance. It just made sense. First of all, this looks, and I think this vav got left out. I put it in. Re'ehu, his friend, Ha'adulami, the Adumalamite, Timnata. And they went to Timna. They went to, up to Timna to check over the shearing of the sheep. Vayal al Gozazet Sono, he went up to supervise the uh, shearing of his sheep. Vayal Rashi just simply explains that in full. He says, Vayal Timnata, he went up to Timna, La Amod al Gozazet Sono. So it literally it means to stand over the shearing of his sheep. So it means to supervise it, right? To supervise this, this, the, actually, by the word, look at the word supervise, right? I think it means look over, okay? To be above, to look above and look over. So the actual word supervise. At any rate, is it, just a thought. Is this town? Oversee. Yeah, oversee, exactly. Oversee. Yeah, good. Where's, it, where's this town at? Is that near Bethlehem or someplace? I do not know. I'd have to look. Okay. Didn't, didn't, that okay. wasn't part of my research, okay? Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, onwards here, let's see. So, uh, Okay, on to Vayugad le Tamar, and it was told to Tamar. Tamar heard. Wait, there is a Rashi. Yes. Did you get I, that? Yes, we said okay. to stand right to supervise the shearing of oh. a sheep. We did it. Um, it talks about Samson. Yes, we haven't done that. We haven't done that verse yet. We're coming to that verse now. That's verse this thirteen. Is verse thirteen. Yeah, we're just getting to verse. Oh, 13. oh, oh, okay. I'm we sorry. We I was done it yet. similar, so I was getting confused. No problem. No problem. So Tamar was told, Lamor, in these so in these words, Hine Chamecha, behold, your father in law, Ole Timnata, is going up to Timna, La Goz Sono, to shear his sheep. Okay, so here's the Rashi. Allah Timnata, or Le Timnata, goes up to, is going up to Timna. Uvo Shimshon Omer, but with regards to the story of Samson, it says, Vayered Shimshon Vigomer Timnata. It says that Samson went down to Timna. With Jacob, it says he went up to Timna. Samson, it says he went down to Timna. That's because Timna was located on the slope of the mountain. Yoshevet. It was it it was located at the on the slope of the mountain. 
Olin Lamikan, so you go up from one side, but you're Din Lamikan, and you come down from the other side. It's, uh, I wonder if there's some humor in this particular Rashi, right? As, as in da, right? D U H. But Tasar Big Day Almanuta, so she removed, she removed her widow's clothing. May Allah from off of her, Vatachas Bitsaif, and she covered herself with a veil. Vatit alaf. So this is um, this would probably mean that she she couldn't be recognized. Uh, Lauren, if you have something different there in your translation, let me know. In verse fourteen. Vateshev befetach einayim, and she sat at the crossroads. Right at the crossroads. Asher al derech timnata which was on the way to Timna, ki ra'ata, because she saw, ki gadal Shela, that Shela had grown up, vihi lo nitna lo leisha, and she was not given to him as a wife. So now she understood that Judah had no intention of marrying her to Shela. And now she's taking matters into her own hands. Titalaf, there we go. So this word titalaf, sometimes I think it can mean that a, it could be with an aleph that it, that one faints. But anyway, kista paneha. There we go. She covered her face shelo yakirba so that he wouldn't recognize her. Vateshev befetach einayim, and she sat at the cross at the crossroads. Literally, it means at the opening of the eyes. Okay, bepetichat einayim. Okay, so it says Pidichat Einaim, just another way of putting it up, meaning crossroads. The Parshat Drachim, that's another way, that's another for Hebrew way to describe crossroads. She'al Derech Timnata, which was on the way to Timna, Verabotenu Darshu. And our rabbis interpreted in Tractate Sota, Be Pitcho Shel Avraham Avinu. So, he, they, he, that he, that she was at the entrance of Abraham, our patriarch. Shekol einaim mitzapot oto, because everybody was hoping, was trying to see him. So, I think that what he means here, that what Rashi is saying, is to establish the desire of Abraham. Remember, Abraham had one had one fear that he and Sarah would never have a child. That was the one thing that Abraham that worried Abraham. And here this is of course her intention. In other words, her intention is to make sure that Abraham does not have to fear that. Kira ataki gadel shela because she saw that shela had grown up the fikach he kira atzma etzel yehuda and for this reason she made herself available to Judah shahita mit aver because she desired she lusted la amid imenu banim to be able to have sons from him. She was happy to have the sons from his children, but if that wasn't going to happen, she was going to have sons. She wanted her sons to be descended from Judah. And it had nothing to do with any uh, lusting of any other kind, but just a desire to provide children. And that's, again, circumstances alter cases. And here the circumstance is that she had no no lascivious thought in her mind when she did this. Her one intention was to provide children to make sure that's what she wanted to do. And I believe that's what they mean by Pit Choshel Avraham Avinu. In a sense, you know, at the at the entrance of Abraham's grave, maybe. Okay. But that's here it says uh, residence, but okay. I mean it's in parentheses that, no, and nice. I guess your guess is yeah. as good as theirs. Mm -hmm. The point is that it's got about it's got to do with Abraham's desire to have offspring. Yeah, it says um, to the at the entrance 
to the residence of our father Abraham, which all eyes looked forward to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is probably, I wouldn't mind having seen some interpretation of that to exactly what, what they were intending by that, unless it simply has to do with Abraham's righteousness. The idea of making sure that human beings act in a righteous way and that we all long at least most of us i suspect long to see righteousness established and that's so, what abraham was doing yeah Go does ahead. that hurt yeah i was just going to ask does that make her like it sounds like that makes her a righteous person yes. right because so so does that also tie back to maybe why the first two sons died you know, because of the fact that they were not righteous, right? And she couldn't have children by them because they, they wouldn't have been worthy of it. In, in sense. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think you're right. I think you've touched on, a, on an interesting connection there, right? She is definitely considered a righteous person. But and she even, did do a yeah. deceptive, she, she operated through deception. So right. that's correct. You know, it's but, not so straightforward to see her as... No. No. Uh, like Abraham, I mean, in the case of Abraham and Sarah, they decided to do a kind of surrogate uh, yes. parenting, but Correct. they did it uh, explicitly. They decided and they made the decision, and there was no deception. Right. Yeah. Right. I, no, I I agree with you. I'm just saying though that her intentions here at the end sound like they're they're very pure, right? In, in terms of, you know, singular desire to have children. So anyway, that, that was my point, but okay. I, th I think it touches on life's complexities. Yep. I don't believe the Torah wants to suggest that the ends justify the means. I certainly don't want to live that way myself. Right. But the trouble was she was dealing with a man who had no intention of fulfilling what he said he was going to do. And, and likewise, we saw Jacob resort to trickery to, on some level with Laban. And I think that in some ways the Torah is trying to help us deal with an issue with what do you do when it's a matter of survival and you're dealing with someone who is not honest? Are you allowed to, to possibly resort to, to levels of deception in order to survive? And I think the answer is yes, you want, a da you want damage control, and it has to do with the nature of it. But remember, this whole story that with Jacob started off that way, right? With a certain level of deception. But the problem is you have to deal with the reality. And we're not dealing with pie in the sky. You know, part of the, part of the challenge of religion is to take values that, that may well be uh, eternal, but are ethereal because trying to apply them, to actually apply them to the way life works out. And if you think about it, the uh, I just was reading in the Heschel book that we're reading at services, Passion for Truth, right? The degree to which people lie and to the degree to which falsehood is, is out there and the degree to which truth is actually assailed by falsehood. And so how do you how do you still in that particular case, how do you look at the big picture and say, I realize there may be prices to pay, but if I want I want victory in the final in the final sense, how does it get achieved? And it's not simple. There's no black and white answer here. Life is shaded. I, mean, I think we truth. should look for Befetach Parshanud on those words Befetach Nayim because yes. I don't think, I think, you know, we don't, we have not cracked this one and maybe that would be a, a place to look. Okay. All right. I'll see if I, if I have a chance to take a look at it. Okay. I'm looking, here we go. Uh, here's the Batesha of Bepetach Einayim. And there's a whole bunch of stuff down here. So, and another one here too, by the way, here's another comment on that. So let me see if that sheds any light on this. Yeah. Okay. All right, okay, uh, and of course, and of course, by the way, just one thing that jumps out in, immediately, right, is petach enaim, the open eyes, the opening of the eyes. What did she do? She covered herself. Look at the irony, right? She mm -hmm. covered herself with a veil, right, so that she was unrecognizable, and she sat <laughs> at open eyes. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> yep. okay, yeah, 
Okay, let's. Uh, are we tomorrow? Today. Uh, good question. I can't believe we're already out of time. Uh, I'm thinking of it. Uh, I, so let's let's plan it. If it's not going to happen, I will let you know. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to stop the share. Though I might miss it because I think I'm I got called into the ECC. Right? Uh, okay. Tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Let me let me see something. Okay. I want to make sure that uh, we are at the place. So I want to find paste the place here. Okay. Uh, right. So it's at Ted Vav. We're at Ted Vav. Let me mark the place. And God willing, we'll meet tomorrow. I, I had been giving it some thought, I can tell you that. Okay, and I'm gonna put the bookmark in here. Let's see here. Okay, so, and I'm going to stop the share at this point. And wish uh, those who are listening uh, all the best and stop the recording.